Thanks everyone for coming, and uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, Violet Blue. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming and piling in here. This is really packed, and it's really, really awesome. Um, before I say anything, I just want to let you know that um, there won't be any explicit uh, sexual imagery up here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Everyone's over 18, right? Uh, but there is going to be some frank sexual talk. So if you're uncomfortable with frank, graphic, explicit sexual talk, now's the time to probably leave. I saw some of you brought lunch in. You might want to finish that up. <laughs> probably a good idea. So um, if you looked at the posters uh, that were so sweetly put all over the Google campus, you have an idea of, of sort of my resume. And what that basically describes is that I've been a sex educator and a writer for almost 10 years. Um, I have over 20 published books. Um, in this form, the print form. And um, I have some e-media as well. I have audiobooks and some e-books coming out soon. The stuff that I've written is all nonfiction, so it's all how-to information on sex, which stems from being a sex educator, working in the field, um, lecturing, doing peer-to-peer -peer support, peer-to-peer -peer counseling, and working with uh, Sex Information Hotline, San Francisco Sex Information, that's sfsi.org, um, which is a basically we take anyone and everyone who has some kind of crazy emergency, sometimes non-emergency, or just sort of am I normal question about sex, and talk to them. And I lecture to the students. So I'm actually at the point now where I educate the educators. Um, and when I worked at Good Vibrations, I helped develop their educational department. And what I did there was I also developed their outreach department, which was sending teams to places like Planned Parenthood and teaching them about sex toys, um, and sending teams to places like halfway houses for developmentally disabled adults and teaching them, you know, about good sex and bad sex and being able to sort of navigate their life as adults and things like that. So I have a pretty wide repertoire. I have a lot of experience, a lot of online experience with sex and searching for sex. Um, not just because I've had a blog for a long time and I've been doing pod sex podcasting for a long time, but also because I've been working for a site called fleshbot.com for the past several years. And Fleshbot is a Gawker Media site. However, um, we're sort of an island unto ourselves in many ways in that um, it's been run by one person. It's been run by Jono for a very long time. And I was the second person that he hired to come on, um, partly because he was reblogging a lot of stuff that I was blogging. And then we started talking and we're like, hey, we should just do this together. But he also wanted to bring in um, inclusivity to the site. So it's a site you know, that's for it's primarily targeted toward a heteronormative audience, so like a straight male audience, if you will, about porn, run by a gay man, administrated by someone like me. So, and then since then we've hired a bunch of other bloggers so that we can have a really cover a really diverse spectrum, all genders and or, all orientations, and sort of also get in a little bit of a subversive message that there isn't just one kind of sex out there. So the title of this talk is Sex on the Internet, The Realities of Porn, Sexual Privacy Online, and Search, which actually wasn't the title that I picked. Um, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was my editor in the front row. Um, so I, I came up with a subtitle, which is Cataloging All the World's Information, Even If It's Taboo. As you can see, I have um, someone looking for Ceiling Cat. And if you're unfamiliar with Ceiling Cat, there, it's an online lol cat meme. Ceiling Cat is watching you masturbate. So the joke is that Ceiling Cat is watching you do naughty things which I think is a great analogy for things about sexual privacy online. And I'm going to be doing a bit of reading here because there, I've done, there are a lot of things in here called facts that I want to make sure that I get right, so <laughs> believe it or not. Um, the internet has changed human sexuality forever as we know it. I think that we have yet to see the effects of how the internet has changed the way that we express ourselves as human beings. Um, Basically, sexual information has been locked down, commodified. It's been held in certain channels. It's been presented in certain ways. Um, sexual information and pornography has been held to controlling interests due to government influences, due to personal opinion, due to re religious influences, um, and also um, due to distribution influences. Um, distribution influence is primarily being people like booksellers who won't sell books about certain sex, sex topics, which is why a majority of my books are with independent publishers. So I can talk about sex from an all genders, all orientations perspective, which mainstream sex publishing is still scared to death of, even though they're trying to negotiate with me for books, they're still like super afraid that I talk to gays and stuff like that. It's amazing how backwards they are. But 
the internet has sort of leveled the playing field for what I see as the democratic dissemination of sex information and being able to sort of talk to everyone about that. Um, basically, it's sort of like a free market approach to sex. People are being able to sort of look for what they want and find what they want. Working on a site like Flushbot, I've been able to see and see stats and look at stats at what people are actually interested in. I've been able to sort of play with and test with looking what you know, people have been looking for. Well, and not just on Flushbot, but on my site and other sites as well. Um, what's really afforded people the opportunity to start to make choices about developing what I see as their own sort of sexual operating systems because I come from the belief that everyone's sexuality is as individual to them as a fingerprint. And we sort of take in information from different places and we assemble what, what works best for us. And I think that it's a constant assembly. I think that, you know, if the first version didn't work, say it was beta and do it again. So, um, so basically what's affording people the ability to do this is being able to go online and have what they perceive as sexual privacy. Um, you know, it used to be that you would need to go to the porn store or you would go, you know, you would get an Adam and Eve catalog with a very limited range of things to choose from that, you know, were sex toys that weren't even necessarily chosen because they're made of healthy products but just because they're made of cheap products and put together by people who don't really care about the sexual health, the sexual pleasure or what's going on with people that they're selling these products to. Well, like I said, the internet has changed that because people now have privacy. Of course, the problem is that people aren't as anonymous as they think. Um, what I want to talk about for is I want to talk about the user first, and it's who looks for sex online and what are they looking for. Well, I think the first obvious answer to all of that is that people are looking at sex online to get off, and I know that it's horribly taboo to talk about, but basically what we're talking about is masturbation, people jacking off. There are a lot of perceptions about people who are interested in sex. Um, the idea of anyone being interested in sex other than for usual mainstream media reasons is, is quite taboo. The idea of looking at sex or being interested in sex purely for the sake of pleasure is something that a lot of people just simply don't want to talk about. Um, and the perceptions of people who are doing that um, tend to get shoved in the corner of the guy with the raincoat. You know, it's that sort of stereotype where it's like, oh, well, if you're really interested in sex or if you're searching for it or looking for it, you must, you know, immediately be doing something immoral or be thinking bad thoughts. Who else is looking for it? Well, people who are curious. Anyone who is curious about sex. I'm sure pretty much everyone in the world at this point has opened up a browser and typed in sex just to see what's going to come up. Because we're curious. We're monkeys. Um, it's true. Um, I think... Another, another group of people who are looking for sex online are people who are seeking accurate, non-biased, non-judgmental sex information. Sometimes that information that they're looking for is urgent, and I'll go into that in a second. Another subset of people who are looking for sex online are people who are seeking community. People who feel alone, desperate, isolated, and even folks who just want to know if they're normal or not, which is pretty much the most common question, am I normal? Um, a couple of quick points which I'll develop later as well is um, the role of search in all of this. First of all, I think the role of, such, the role of search in sex, the strongest role, is fighting spam. It's a big, big problem. It's a big problem for people like me who want to get accurate information out there. Um, and I just can't even imagine what you all go through dealing with spammers because they're just... They're pretty insidious. Unfortunately, they're not like trolls because trolls, t trolls are stupid and easily defeated. Spammers tend to be a little smarter, which is a bummer. Um, also in the role of search, I think, is understanding perceived sexual minorities or people who are perceived as sexual minorities, their practices, and especially their self-labeling. Staying active with the current online taxonomy for the terms that perceive sexual minorities, and I'm talking even about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans people, um, staying current with that taxonomy that they used to self-identify with is really tricky because it's changing all the time. Um, I recently did a series of, of pieces where I was data mining Craigslist. And I data mined Craigslist because I just wanted to see like who was looking for what at any given point, any given time, in any given neighborhood in San Francisco. And it was pretty interesting to see who was into what into different neighborhoods. Some things were fairly predictable, like the, you know, the cliche of the businessman looking for the quick blow job in, you know, in, you know, the hotel district, that's pretty obvious. But I came up with some other surprises as well. What I really came up with um, that surprised me, which I didn't develop into a piece, was what I started figuring out when I was data mining Craigslist. And I'm talking about, um, you know, just the quick and dirty personals. 
is when I started doing it on a nationwide level because I started to unearth taxonomy that even I was unfamiliar with that people were using as terms to search for and to connect with each other. So I think that part of the role of search is kind of keeping up with those terms and maybe even having community liaisons who can help explain what these terms mean and demystify these terms. Um, one piece I wrote while I was at South by Southwest, I got this email from um, an F to M porn site, which is female to male transsexual, and um, they were having a hard time with their Google AdSense words, where words that they consider respectful and that they use to identify themselves in a way, I, there are a lot of disrespectful terms that are used um, toward these sexual minorities, especially transsexual people. Um, and the terms that they used to self-identify were sort of getting put in the wrong bucket and ending up coming up as, you know, ads for things that were really insulting, degrading, disgusting, and even illegal. So they appealed to me for help, and I just sort of made some noise about it, and I think it sort of raised the level of awareness of how people are labeling themselves. So I think the other role of search that I think is really important is understanding the importance of unbiased results, whether for the user's titillation, i.e. porn, healthy sexual expression, pleasure, and enjoyment. Um, and, you know, as we all know, porn is legal in America. Um, the emergent trend of sex news and entertainment resources, such as blogs, or for the delivery of accurate sex information, all of which I think can easily get confused with spam. So that's really tricky. So the question is, and I'll go back to who these people are now, is who needs sexual privacy, accurate search results, and unbiased sex information the most? And now I'm talking specifically about perceived sexual minorities. Lesbian, gays, bisexual, and transgender people. Those identified by their sexual orientation or gender identity, regardless of their interest in the act of sex. In most places, LGBT and questioning people face hostility from within as from without the outside world. Community, healing, hookups, and hot porn, which is important, can be found online, of course. Matthew Shepard found out in 1998 that being gay in Wyoming was a death sentence. Brutal transgender murders like Brandontina, which is what the movie Boys Don't Cry was based on, still happen as evidenced in the 2002 murder of 17-year-old um, male to female Gwen Aruja from Newark, California. But with a quick Google search now, trans identity becomes more of a community and less of a mystery, or a quote, gay panic murder defense when justice should have, had, should have been served, which it wasn't. Anyone with an outsider sexual interest, such as people Apple folks. No, this is actually. Um, <laughs> I, was in the, I was in the Pride Parade this year, and so I, I thought this was a great shot that I took from the car that I was riding in. I was, I, I was riding with um, my adopted mother, who is transgender um, captain, or president, rather, of the Police Commission of San Francisco, Teresa Sparks. Um, but anyone with an outsider sexual interest, such as a fetishist, oh. and by fetishist, I actually mean someone into balloons or coeds with colds. It's a, it's a real site, check it out. Um, it's, not, it's not explicit, it's really cute. Um, anonymity and direct access allows someone who feels alone, possibly self-hating and misunderstood, and often a fetishist hides their favorite way to masturbate from their chosen and lifelong sex partners to find community. And fetishes, you know, just really quickly, I'm not just talking about lunars, but I'm also talking about, you know, when you think of, of sexual fetish, you know, we tend to think of, you know, the people who are sort of more interested in, like, the fringes or the more extreme or the more funny or, or the more, you know, outrageous or easy to make fun of sexual interests. But, you know, common sexual fetishes or more socially accepted fetishes are like big boobs or big dicks. So it's food for thought. BDSM and kink interested people as well. Those interested in power exchange sex, bondage, sensory play, pain, complicated scenarios and predicaments that involve fear and power over scenes are common targets for media discrimination. Until Hollywood gets over it and the dinosaur era mainstream media outlets shop, stop showing BDSM as abuse, using it as a trope for female degradation, and telling us that kink and BDSM are dark and dangerous habits that can kill you, which is exactly what happened in the SF Weekly two weeks ago and in a CNN article yesterday, um, Psychi and psychiatrists stop categorizing BDSM interests as an illness. These people still need access. They need information and they need community. Again, anyone needing non-biased, accurate sex information. That's any kid in the Bible Belt worried that they're pregnant because their boyfriend came on their leg. This is an actual question that we got on the Spissy hotline. And this we've seen actually as a direct result of four or five years of abstinence education in schools. Um, since abstinence education has come into schools, 
uh, across the nation, we at the hotline have seen an increase in calls from young people who really are like, oh my god, can I get AIDS from sitting on a toilet seat? Because no one's telling them what's going on. And unfortunately, as an effect, we're seeing a rise in STD rates as well because they're not knowing how not to get, and they don't even know what they're doing, actually. They think they can, they think that, you know, not, they think that oral sex isn't sex, and they're thinking that anal sex is something that helps maintain their virginity. So, we're also talking about trans people so desperate they want to self-medicate with hormones. Someone wondering if they're gay, Someone trying to asphyxiate themselves during masturbation without killing themselves and needing to know how. The guy who wrote me last week about a broken condom with his girlfriend, or the girl that emailed me last month who had just had sex for the first time and couldn't stop the bleeding and didn't know what to do. I was the person she reached out to, a total stranger, but someone that she felt that she could ask this question to. And, you know, that's also the guy with a flashlight stuck in his ass who should have just visited sphissy.org. So... Who else needs this information? Yeah. Women. In a January Nielsen Net Ratings poll, they found that one in three women were accessing porn online. And that's just women who self-disclosed that they were, we were accessing porn online. Of course we're looking at porn, but we're doing so in privacy, or at least what we perceive to be privacy. We're more empowered as ever, women, period, to ask for what we want sexually, at least of ourselves in anonymity and be and fuck whoever we want in whatever form we want in places like Second Life where you can be a different gender if you want to. Female bloggers don't need to be sex bloggers to have serious need for online privacy, but gender does make us sexual targets. I don't need to communicate to you how many about how women are sexual targets online. Statistically and in real life, we all know a female rape victim. Cyberstalking, as we all know, gets horrifically ugly when it's focused on women. Sex workers. Sex workers of all gender. This means porn stars as well. I have an interesting example of that in a moment, actually. Their online privacy also equals their physical safety, and differing jurisdictions may or may not agree. Sex shoppers, porn and sex toy consumers, customers. People plunk down their credit cards and personal info online all too often without assessing the risk of doing so. There's often so much sex sexual shame involved in whatever they're buying, they tend to just go for it. Some companies bait and switch customers, saying they'll ship in a plain brown wrapper while selling customer info to third parties. Pretty much everyone. Anyone who could lose a job, a lover, a friend, a court case, child custody or visitation, freedom under the Constitution, or could face physical or emotional harm from being added for their interest in sex or sexual identity. Um, and that sounds like a sermon, but I have a couple of examples to show you. So what we're talking here about, in a lot of ways, is the illusion of sexual privacy online. If people knew how much their privacy was at risk when they paid for porn or posted or answered that Craigslist ad or searched for K9 in Google, would they still do it? Probably. It's easy for those of us who know our way around the internet to laugh at Nigerian bank scammers, but the internet is growing new users every single day and will continue to until you all stop reading. But no one's telling people not to do stupid things like give out personal info in sexual situations from experimentation and masturbation to point of purchase because the whole topic is still taboo. How many of you have heard of the Craigslist experiment? Okay, so that's, I would say, about a quarter of the room. All right. Sorry to show you this photo, it's horrifying. <laughs> the Craigslist experiment. In September 2006, griefer extraordinaire Jason Fortuny and his friend took a hardcore women seeking men ad from another city and reposted it on Craigslist Seattle to see how many replies he and his friend could get in 24 hours. Then he published every single response. Photos, emails, IM info, phone numbers, names, everything to public wiki encyclopedia dramatica. Then they went public on Jason's live journal page, calling it the Craigslist experiment, inviting readers to identify the Craigslist ads responders and add more info. Quote, your goal, identify people you know IRL in real life and point them out. We've already had great successes here. The page is still live. This is a screen cap from just last week. It wasn't just any kind of ad, but a hardcore BDSM ad posting where a female submissive was looking for a rough male dominant to beat her up and fuck her. The ad's language suggests to me and many other sex educators that the original poster actually had no idea what the language they were using meant. Clearly what the person was asking for was well beyond the safe, sane SM community definitions. This and a few other details suggested to me and other sex educators that I talked to about it that the original ad may have indeed been placed by a man experimenting with transgender identity, searching for that female extreme, the, ex the extreme of female submission. Here's the text. 
The point is, Jason and his cohort, cohort took the ad at face value as an average and got a face value response to what the ad's message sent out to the world. They got 178 responses with 145 photos of men, cocks, faces, and more, full email addresses, both personal and business addresses, names, and a few IM names and phone numbers. One respondent, uses a, one respondent used a Microsoft employee email address, and another used a USR Army military email address. Respondents emailed Fortuny asking him to take the info down, and he simply published their requests. Fortuny then had his private info published to Craigslist and was threatened physically with lawsuits and has been basically hated on by everyone from online BDSM communities to Wired who called him socio sociopathic. Now, while researching my sex books, I've placed ads on Craigslist just to get a random sampling or to get ideas. Every time I've received an overwhelming amount of troll responses, of course, with photos I didn't ask for, um, offers I didn't ask for, and sometimes some pretty evil language. I've definitely entertained the idea of doing something with this information that they're sending me, but just thinking about it makes me feel better. It was, it's something that I could never conceive of someone actually doing in real life, but unfortunately in this case someone did. Um, and it's pretty common. Um, I actually j have joked with other female sex bloggers and female sex educators about receiving unsolicited, inf like extremely personal uh, information from people via email, and in fact have joked over beers, oh my god, you got a face pick, you rate. So, ultimately, in the Craigslist experiment, a high percentage of these guys' lives were changed in a major way. Now, here's the, here's the not eat your lunch photo. Censored, censored for your viewing pleasure. Um, and this is how we censored it when we put it on Flashbot. The top photo is someone's who's, someone whose photo was reposted, and the bottom photo was the photo that was used in the ad. Um, some might argue that the Craigslist experiment is an in inevitable form of online natural selection. If you have something to lose, don't do something that could make you lose it. And I think, personally, that if our culture was made to feel less ashamed about sex, Jason's results would be quite different. In a follow-up to the, the uh, blog posting that I did on my personal blog, I received an email forwarded from the King County Prosecuting uh, Attorney's Office stating, uh, based on what I've read in the media accounts, I would like to say that there is no violation of our state criminal code involved here yet. So what he did was actually legal. Right after the Craigslist experiment, granted this was last year around this time, there was a copycat in Portland. Yesterday, in Gainesville, Florida, there was another copycat post, which was flagged and removed within a few hours. So I have another example for you. It's a very hot photo. <laughs> the police officer recently fired for having, having an adult site. Last month, an Arizona officer was officially fired for running a sex website with his wife when off the clock. A three-judge San Francisco Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals panel ruled against the former first officer's First Amendment free speech right and right to privacy focused case, which of course directly affects any individual sexual privacy online and shows, I think, just how ignorant a lot of um, U.S. Circuit judges are about the Internet. The judges ruled that because what the former officer did was, quote, vulgar, indecent, sleazy, and disreputable, he has no right to keep his job as a public servant. The thing is, what the former officer and his wife did was simple, boring, amateur porn. Okay, I'm sorry, but I'm surprised anyone <laughs> paid for it. Seriously, it was just, he, it was like they're swingers, right? It was just like him and his wife, and it was a pay site, and it would be pictures of him and her having sex, pictures of her masturbating, or pictures of her with another girl. So, I mean, it's pretty, pretty pedestrian stuff, considering what's out there. The only offense here is that they were a couple being exhibitionist swingers. One judge didn't agree. And I thought that was really interesting. And I have a, a little bit from his uh, concurrence in the judgment. With all due respect, this is from Judge Canby. With all due respect, I am unable to join the majority opinion. Under the facts of the case and the existing precedent, the police department could not discharge Dibble, Ronald Dibble, that's his name, for his website expression without violating the First Amendment. As the majority opinion points out, Dibble was careful not to identify himself or his website with the police department or with police status at all. Now, I recognize that pornography, although apparently popular, is not a very respected subject of First Amendment protection in many quarters. The majority opinion here reflects that distaste, variously characterizing Dibble's expressive activities as vulgar, indecent, sleazy, and disreputable. But vigorous enforcement of, of the free speech guarantee of the First Amendment often requires that we protect speech that many, even a majority, find offensive. 
Pornography and sexual expression in general is protected by the First Amendment when that does not constitute obscenity, and there is no showing that Dibble's expression meets that extreme standard. When, sexu when, applied to sexually, sorry, when applied to sexually expressive activities, this ruling has disturbing potential for expansive application. And this is a photo I actually took at Pride this year. Um, the, all of the, I rode with the police contingent, which is really fun, and they were very, very proud. These are their pride beads hanging from their sidearms. Um, the judge concluded, a measurable segment of the population, for example, is vigorously antagonistic to homosexual activity and expression. It could easily be encouraged to mobilize where a police officer discovered to have engaged off-duty and unidentified by his activity in a gay pride parade or expressive cross-dressing or any number of expressive activities that might fan the embers of antagonism smoldering in a part of the population. I have another example. And this is, a, this is a more first person example here. The story of anonymous sex blogger girl with a one track mind. This is a recent screen cap from her site. As I've told you, I've been a blogger and an occasional Girl Friday editor at fleshbot.com for the past few years. A job when full time requires me to scour the internets for explicit sexual content of reasonable quality. Uh, we endeavor to cover a wide range of sexual expression and all genders and orientations. Um, and I'll tell you, when Jono lives in New Orleans, and when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, I ended up running Fleshbot for two months by myself with no, basically no other employees. So I was doing 12 to 15 posts a day. So that pretty much required me to be an expert on taxonomy, terminology, where to find it, how to find it, who was doing circle jerk linking, who was doing spamming, you know, who was you know, doing redirects, and get myself really familiar with the, uh, the variety of different types of sexual expression online and also see how they could be blogged. Um, we, we have a regular feature that's called the Sex Blog Roundup. And what the Sex Blog Roundup is, it's really cool because um, what it is, is it's a, it's a weekly installment where we do a post that takes excerpts from sort of the best of individual sex blogs. And these are sex blogs that are text, usually no photos, um, in fact, rarely photos if ever. So what we're concentrating on is is text porn erotica, basically erotic lit. But what's exciting about it is that it's generally people's real life experiences as they're writing them down, usually as anonymous bloggers. When I did this weekly, I had upwards of 200 text only sex blogs written by individuals worldwide in my RSS reader outside the 50 to 75 usual suspects of variety sex blogs, MSM news, link dumps, link dumps and other sex news blogs. Every week I would have to call for new blogs and read them and add to my feeds more because invariably a handful of sex bloggers who were blogging anonymously had to quit blogging, meaning they were for one reason or no another no longer anonymous. It was such a regular occurrence, I developed a pretty snarky attitude toward the limited lifespan anonymous sex blogger, even though they often offered up the juiciest and most explicit posts about sex. There are still a lot of regular anonymous sex bloggers who maintain their privacy, but they're extremely careful and very web savvy in doing so. Although I know a number of them outside their web personas from New York to Alaska and to London, London is where I found the hot post of single anonymous female sex blogger, the loved and respected girl with a one-track mind. When I visited London a few years back, I met the girl in the flesh and we had a very good night of good old-fashioned English drinking. We went out to pubs and we had a fabulous time. What was really interesting though was that the entire time I was hanging out with her and talking about trials and tribulations of sex blogging, blogging on the internet, um, blogging personal, blogging, you know, versus blogging private stuff, et cetera, et cetera, because on my personal blog, I blog about my own life as well. Um, she refused to tell me her actual name the entire evening we spent together. She, in fact, told me a pseudonym. I thought that was kind of interesting. She also picked my brain because she really, really wanted to be a pub published author, author. She wanted a book. She wanted a book about her website. She wanted a book about her blog and a book about her exploits, which she got. She later did get that book deal, named uh, after her blog, and upon publication in August of last year, found herself ambushed outside her London flat by paparazzi and outed in the UK tabloids three days after the book was published. She wrote, I guess I was lulled into a false sense of security regarding my anonymity because I knew that Belle du Jour, who is another an anonymous sex blogger uh, and also British, was hounded by the press and still managed to keep her identity private. Whilst I may have a high-traffic blog and a book detailing my sexual adventures in the shops, I'm not a prostitute like her, so why, I figured, would anyone really be interested in who I am? 
On the 2000th anniversary of her outing, she recently blogged, in re retrospect, I could talk about how I was the laughing stock at work, everyone in the UK film industry knowing and discussing the most intimate details of my sex life. She worked on the Harry Potter films, by the way. I could talk about how I had to go into hiding and how for a week the tabloids poked their long lens cameras through my parents' letterbox and rang their doorbell and telephone constantly, making both me and my parents live in a state of anxiety. I could talk about how profoundly I was affected by the articles on me, both in the media and online, how I wanted to challenge the lies, misrepresentations, and personal attacks, but couldn't. I could talk about how I wasn't made rich by the book and that losing my film career as a result of it made me worry that I wouldn't be able to pay my rent. I could talk about how my friends were offered money to spill the dirt on me and people from my past suddenly reappeared in my life, making me paranoid that I couldn't trust anyone. Here's a picture of her. She writes for Guardian UK now. I could talk about how all my ex-lovers contacted me, concerned that I had disguised them fully, all of them now aware of my previous hidden feelings about them. I could talk about how I then decided to give online dating another go, only to discover that somehow every man I got into conversation with, ended up on a date with, knew that I was Abby Lee, and was a fan of the blog, making me immediately scamper in the other direction because I felt so vulnerable. I could talk about how almost all the men I've met and or been intimate with have asked me not to write about them, even when we've had no more than a pint together. I could talk in explicit detail about all the hot or not sex I've had, but feel too exposed now that everyone knows who I am and my friends, colleagues, and acquaintances all read the blog. I could talk about all these things on the blog if I were still anonymous, but I'm not. My outing last year was a huge strain on me, and yes, I have managed to find a silver lining out of it, but the ability to freely do the one thing that gave me such pleasure, blogging, has been destroyed. Take the anonymity away from a blogger who depends on it, and you get a blog with no heart. True sincerity and authenticity about events, people, thoughts, and feelings rely on anonymity. I'll challenge anyone who says that anonymity shouldn't matter when someone is writing about their own lives. It does. So, let me lighten the atmosphere for a minute. <laughs> so, active threats to sexual privacy online. Well, right now that would be the U.S. government. Is anyone here familiar with 2257 laws or the Child Obscenity Act? A very small amount of people. Okay, great. In a nutshell, 2257 refers to regulations under the Child Protection and Obscenity Enforcement Act of 1988 which specifies record-keeping requirements for those wishing to produce sexually explicit media and imposes criminal penalties for failure to comply. This is supposedly to ensure that no person under the legal age is involved in porn, though is, of course, only pursued within the realm of the perfectly legal adult porn industry, industry and applicable only in the United States. The regulations are directed toward the terms primary producer and secondary pr producer. Oh, and if you feel like reading, this is a 2257 statement on a Canadian website. It's kind of ironic, don't you think? So the regulations are directed toward the terms primary producer and secondary producer. This part's important. A primary producer is defined in the set of rules as any person who actually films, videotapes, photographs, or photographs a visual depiction of actual sexually explicit conduct. A secondary producer is defined as any person who produces, assembles, manufactures, publishes, duplicates, reproduces, reproduces, or reissues a book, magazine, periodical film, videotape, or other matter intended for commercial distribution that contains a visual depiction of actual sexually explicit conduct. Different record-keeping requirements exist for primary versus secondary producers. One may be both a primary and secondary producer. Not surprisingly, this has come under many legal challenges. As the definitions of actual sexually explicit conduct and secondary producer are vague, perhaps intentionally so. Just as the definition of obscenity in the courts is left to so-called community standards, for instance, a fisting DVD may not be considered obscene by San Francisco community standards, but it most certainly would be in Laramie, Wyoming. That's how obscenity, um, that's how obscenity is prosecuted in America on a federal level at this point. It's sort of a blanket, you know, uh, leaving it to community standards, letting the communities decide what's obscene for them or not. But I believe that these laws are intentionally vague. I believe that the wording about sexually explicit conduct is intentionally vague, and I believe that the, the definition of sexually, uh, secondary producer is intentionally vague as well. Um, and I think that that's sort of mafia style on the government side of things, to keep anyone who comes near a porn image ever unsure if they're in violation of the law. And when recent 2257 record-keeping requirements came down uh, about a year and a half ago, which have been challenged about secondary producers, which is reposting the content, 
I got in this great conversation with a friend of mine who runs um, a, an erotic online magazine, which is primarily just like non-explicit pinup galleries and um, covering sex events around the United States and then articles about sex and sexuality and sort of news briefs and things like that. And his boss made it his job to go through every single image that they had on the site and try to determine if each image was considered sexually explicit conduct. And I talked to him on the phone while he was going through it and he was like, I'm looking at this picture of a girl's ass and I'm like, is that red from a sunburn or is it red from a spanking? <laughs> so, you see what we're going through here? Now, the idea of of having porn producers keep stringent laws or keep stringent records is of course a really good idea. Um, what's unfortunate is that this is being enforced in legitimate adult businesses. Um, it's not being thought of or applied to anything outside of legitimate adult businesses. And these you know, mainstream porn people who have these giant companies and corporations like Vivid and Wicked and stuff like that, they want to keep their businesses. They're making a lot of money. Of course they're going to follow the rules. Um, it's, it's, it's ridiculous that they're raiding these people and they're not really doing anything else with this. But what's interesting about this to me, sexual privacy wise, this poses a serious threat to sex workers. And now you wouldn't think about this, but I have personal experience with this at this point, not because I'm a sex worker, but as a blogger. She looks pretty young, doesn't she? It's kind of creepy. This is on her teen website. Um, this is what she's using for her 2257 documentation. So if you click her, on her site for 2257 documentation, this is what you get. This is why you'll start to see it's a pretty serious threat. People don't know what to do and they're doing some really scary things. Notably to porn performers and extras in video and imagery, the government might consider sexually explicit conduct. For example, more than once for Fleshbot and for my personal blog, porn creators, you know, and p people who make porn, they, they want, you know, they're, they're starting to get the internet, right? They want access to blogs, they want access to traffic, and they also want access to people like me who are educators that will present their material in context. Um, and to, you know, promote their stuff, they'll send, you know, do you want images, do you want a short clip, and do you want the 2257 materials that go with this? Um, to my alarm, I'm FedEx DVDs with scans of each performer's driver's licenses, social security cards, Images of, the, images of them holding their IDs and their social security cards next to their faces. Copies of their contracts and signatures complete with current address and all personal information like their true names. What's important to know is that these performers have no idea this information has been sent to me, nor do they know who I am. And this business practice is commonplace, unfortunately. Some admittedly low-grade sites I have found allow surfers to click through and see the photo IDs of the models. I believe we have yet to see the dark ramifications of the privacy protections these sex workers no longer have. And a quick Google image search, 2257 ID. It's right there. You can find a lot more. So. I mean, I'm serious, serious question. Take. He's asking what types of searches lead to things like this. And all I did, well, safe search off. Um, <laughs> because those passwords are very Hello, I know. Yeah, and there's a lot more like this that are US based. Um, but it was, it was simply a matter of safe search off, going to Google image search, um, typing in 2257 ID. And I also found some when I, went to 20, when I typed in 2257 proof. This was on page four. The teen, I think, was on, the previous teen was on page two. So, and this is, uh, these findings are from la uh, a week ago, last Friday. So, I'll get a fresh one for you next time. Hopefully not. Okay. So, what else is interesting about sexual privacy online and what sort of is posing a threat or bringing up some interesting questions? 2.0 sites and understanding what is and isn't porn. Porn or not? Good question these days, don't you think? On photo sharing social sites like Flickr, some users are finding that their simple pictures of their own feet are ending up in foot fetishist photo pools. <laughs> While some people are perfectly fine with that, others are totally freaking out that someone is having sexual thoughts about their feet. <laughs> Without their express consent, nonetheless. Is it Flickr's role to police these activities? 
Well, it's a really good question and brings into play the changing cultural values and judgments about what constitutes porn, acceptable use of images individuals create, and how they're seen by others. I'll argue that any foot fetishist probably sexualizes feet on the bus, in the park, or online. The only difference is that the online software is giving the foot owners the access to see how the people in the world around them might see their feet. Now they know what they otherwise wouldn't know and can't control. The notions of community standards for porn or obscenity, I believe, simply don't work in application to worldwide data clusters. Social networking sites have no idea where they fall under 2257 regulations as to their role to users and have been fumbling blindly with the notions of community standards with disastrous and embarrassing results. This was a direct result of when, um, or what Flickr's been going through trying to work with the German government around how they want to uh, police their internets. So, I am aware that you had a talk here, um, September 21st, by someone named Shelley Levin. Um, oh no, that's so sad. I really wanted to come, it was the day before my birthday. Oh, I had some questions for her. Um, well, I'll go over a couple of her points, because I think they're really interesting, and I think that they were circulated to all of you as, as fact. Um, I, you know, one of my questions was just if she could provide data or URLs for any of the things that she was asserting. Actually, and it, was about to ask you. <laughs> someone actually offered, um, was someone who disagreed with her, actually really nice. Oh, someone who disagreed with her offered to, you know, find, help find fact and things like that, right? Right. Like offered to go over a presentation and find what things are supported by even surveys or any sort of data points. And I guess that was a bit intimidating. And so she decided to quit because she thought that that was huh. too hostile. Goodness gracious. Well. <laughs> it's a good point though. So you've got people like Shelley Levin out there running around, right? Saying how porn is bad and porn is evil and She's getting a lot of access. Media like to listen to people like her because she says crazy things about porn and people like O'Reilly Factor just eat this stuff up, you know? Um, for instance, I'm... Ah! The frightening visage of Shelley Levin, <laughs> a.k.a. porn star Roxy, who was a performer 10 years ago um, and hasn't been involved in the porn industry since. So that's, you know, kind of speaks to some of the accuracy of her recent experience in data. Um, one of the things she told you guys was that 66% of porn performers are infected with herpes. The truth to that is that one in five Americans are infected and porn performers are no different. How do we know they're no different? Well, I talk with people like Sharon Mitchell at AIM. AIM is the Adult Industry Medical Healthcare Foundation, which was founded many years ago when there was an HIV outbreak in the adult industry. And Sharon Mitchell was working in the industry at the time and realized that there was a serious need for sex education in the porn industry. There was a need for accurate information about STI, STD, and virus transmission. Um, and also, she wanted to set up basically a standardized testing center where all performers would go through the standardized testing center, get tested, be tested regularly, and has worked very closely with the mainstream adult industry people, which are the same people being rated by the FBI to make sure that their records are, you know, that they're employing adults. Um, she works closely with these companies and everyone is on a 30-day regimen for testing um, and they must provide their 30-day testing documentation um, in order to perform on the day that they show up they have to have the documentation with them um, they don't they can't fax it they can't say oh, I'll bring it later or anything like that they have to have it um, and I'll also add too that um, I've done a lot of work and a lot of research and a lot of writing about the type of testing that AIM does because I was really curious like 30 days for screening, like, you know, normally when one goes to get an HIV test, it's a three to six month window in San Francisco, and I was like, how are they doing this turnaround in 30 days? Well, it turns out they're using one of the most advanced HIV tests that you can get in the United States, the PCR DNA test. So, they're pretty on it. One of the things that our lovely Shelley also told you guys was that women do not enjoy making porn. This plays into the myth that women don't like sex, wouldn't enjoy sex out of the context of heteronormative romantic relationships, or enjoy sport fucking. Porn performers are not like the rest of us. They're not. They like sex for sport. They are physically sexual athletes. It's like Cirque du Soleil sex. Seriously, they bend in these crazy positions. Like, and they do it because they like it. People who don't like being in the porn industry leave the porn industry. They don't stay in it. There's a constant amount of people who are interested in getting involved in the porn industry because it's 
quick and easy money. It's starting to be a semi-glamorous profession, and it's pretty regulated. So there's a, a bit of a safety net. Oh, one of the other safety nets I wanted to mention, too, that AIM does is that every, every new talent that comes in, every new model that's girl, boy, trans, whatever, comes through and goes through a, a pre-counseling session before appearing in a video where they sit down and they watch a really kind of boring video that's long and talks about um, STDs and getting tested and what their tests are going to be like and talks to them all about their privacy and their confidentiality. Also talks to them about the social ramifications of getting involved in working in porn and doing sex work. Also talks about um, the counseling programs that are available to them through AIM if they want to do any counseling or they need anybody to talk to. And also AIM has a transition program for people who want to transition into other types of work. So they also help people get other jobs if they decide they don't want to do porn anymore. Um, one of the things that Ms. Levin also said, which is a very commonly asserted myth, porn stars are victims of child abuse and sexual abuse, including early exposure to pornography. As, it, as you probably have heard, there is no single unbiased study that bears this assertion out. It's another shameful myth perpetuated about sex workers. The minute I find a study, the minute I find a study that bears anything about this out, I will most certainly publish it on my website. The only, thing, the only things that I've, come, that, that I've come across that are close to making this assertion based on polls or anything like that come from Christian organizations. So they have an agenda. Um, another thing that Shelley talked about was um, that approximately 10% per of porn performers are currently infected with HIV, and that goes with her 66% of porn performers being infected, you know, the dirty, shameful myth about how they're all gross and dirty and spreading disease and stuff. Shelley doesn't have access to those statistics. She doesn't have access to AIM statistics because they're confidential. One of the other funny things she said, I love this, uh, no other industry has more suicide-related deaths than the porn industry. According to, um, according to the Association of Psychologists and Psychiatrists, healthcare professionals, doctors and dentists have the highest suicide rates, <laughs> also EMTs and nurses, followed by food assembly and preparation personnel. <laughs> that would be people in, working in slaughterhouses, actually. <laughs> What's important to know is why people like Shelley want to come and talk to you and why they want to talk to everybody about why this is all dirty and bad and evil and how we need to close off the internets um, so people can't, you know, for the kids, which, you know, whenever people say that they're doing things for the children, it's always a foil for some other agenda and you should always see it as a red flag as far as I'm concerned. Um, Shelley Lubin is an active proponent of Utah's CP80 legislation which states, at essence, anybody providing open wireless access that a minor uses to access pornography will be subject to a fine. Repeated violations are subject to criminal and or civil prosecution. Now, part of my talk, I was going to um, go on the internets and show you the man behind CP80 uh, legislation is a guy named Ralph Yarrow. And you might want to check him out, check out his Wikipedia page. I mean, as, as updated and accurate as Wikipedia is, it still has interesting information about him and about um, his CP80 legislation, which is, you know, poor 80. Um, the most recent version of the CP80 legislation was signed off and um, publicly endorsed by the governor of Utah. So that's something you all want to check out and keep in mind. So the question is, right, what do we do? How do we talk about this? What are our next steps? As a sex educator, I think that it's a case of informed risk and harm reduction. Is anyone aware of what informed risk or harm reduction is? in a sex ed sense, a couple people. Don't be, don't be embarrassed. Um, I think that for everyone, sexual privacy and sexual access to non-biased, uh, non-judgmental information should be seen as a case of informed risk and an attempt at harm reduction, just like with safer sex. Simply put, harm reduction is a progressive approach to public health which takes into account that people are going to engage in risky behaviors, even if they know better or not. Unprotected sex, drug use, and I'd add, like to add sex in the internet. Harm reduction attempts to mitigate risks and dangers by creating alternatives. Some uh, things that harm reduction has done is rather than just say no or don't drive, drive drunk, harm reduction creates designated driver campaigns and controversial initiatives like the provision of condoms in public schools and needle exchange programs. So here's another fun picture from Pride. 
Opponents counter that harm reduction condones unsafe activities. I think with sex online, and particularly with porn, it's more extreme because pervasive cultural attitudes are still so deeply anti-sex and sex negative. Sexual interest is considered immoral in both media and government. So I think it's now become sort of, I don't know, a pet project of mine, or at least a civic duty to try and tell people how to protect their sexual privacy, privacy because I think it's the most vulnerable kind at this point. I have a huge safer porn surfing page on my website for that very reason. Users need to know basics about protecting their identity, and I think online businesses should educate their users in a non-biased way, and it's getting pretty urgent for them to do so. At the very least, there are basic general privacy guidelines that anyone should know about. Basic safety precautions right up there with always use lube for anal sex. So, people are going to do uninformed and sometimes dumb things with their sexual privacy on the internet. As I said earlier, knowing the risks, the horny surfer will still click a risky link to get off, or because they're curious, or get themselves in shady or dangerous situations because they lack community or information. And even more so since the barriers to internet access and making online content becomes less and lower every day. Those were the cops at Pride. There's the user again. And thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I don't know if we have time for questions or what is. All right, so I've got a microphone here. Cool. Um, the Utah legislation that you brought up made me wonder about something that I've only ever heard sort of rumors and myths about. Mm -hmm. When you have an international community website, like any kind of blogging or live journal or something like that, mm -hmm. then really, like, do you know whose jurisdiction things that are posted there come under? Is it who's hosting the site, or is it where they're reading it? And here, I mean, prosecuting the people who are giving the Wi-Fi seems a little bizarre to me. It, it does, doesn't it? Um, definitely prosecuting people who are providing Wi-Fi seems extremely bizarre. Um, and I think that it speaks to the ignorance of the legislators. When you start to talk about sex, sexual privacy, and sexual activity online, pretty much all doors shut when it comes to legislation, unless you talk about something that you're doing to save the children. And the important point that you brought up is where exactly do social sites fall? Where do, where do things like LiveJournal fall? You know, how, do these, how are these companies, how, where do they fit? How are they going to deal with this? Right now, nobody knows, and they're all sort of trying to figure it out on their own. And I don't think there's an answer to that yet, unfortunately, which is why I'm telling you everybody. Hi. So, 2257 may not bother the big professional pornographers, but uh, it can be a big hassle for social networks, photo sites, uh, anything with user-submitted content. Right. I mean, what do you think is going to happen in that area? That's a really interesting question, um, because social networking sites, some of them have wondered audibly and not whether they fall under 2257 secondary producer content, content restrictions. Um, I don't know if some of you remember TribeNet. But um, TribeNet a couple years ago, um, for whatever their reasons, decided to start voluntarily applying 2257 regulations to their users on their social networking site. Um, and they did so in, with a lot of blanket. Um, so the, the tribe bubble wrap fetish, which was really just about bubble wrap, was suddenly marked as a mature tribe, um, pissing off the users. And it also made users who had adult, site, had adult tribes, you know, which are, were basically places where people could cluster and sort of talk about their interests, um, suddenly they were told directly that they are going to be held responsible for 2257 documentation for everything within their tribes. Um, basically everybody fled tribe and it was the downfall of that site. It's now trying to resurrect itself again, but it didn't work out very well for them. So where do they fall? That's a really good question. Did I answer all of that? Okay. So um, you were talking about how uh, when you were maintaining the site, it was hard for you to get up to date on all the different language available that's mm -hmm. community specific. Um, and I'm wondering, um, I think it would be also challenging for someone who is realizing they want to become part of a community to figure out what the appropriate language is, especially if there's not any local influence. Um, what do you think, I guess, what, what do you think the development for that will be? What do you think the future of that is? How do you think that can be made easier? I think that Making uh, the development of that and making that easier um, is definitely going to be the lowest uh, entry level access that people can get to information about things like this. So keeping something like Wikipedia up to date would be really, really helpful. 
Um, and I would love to see more sex educators get involved in keeping Wikipedia up to date, at least just with the, you know, with the terms and everything that everyone is using, and write, speak more about, you know, how people are self-labeling their gender, what's acceptable and what's not. And, and also what I'd like to see added to that too is, is sort of some, some guidelines to people who do have sexual fetishes and sort of may need some guidelines about how they would behave online as well. One of the things that came up um, when I was uh, taking a look at the, the whole feet thing and people being upset about the feet thing on Flickr was that some people who were, some of the foot fetishists were, were essentially adding themselves by leaving really inappropriate comments. Um, you know, and so there needs to be some language out there that's you know, as accessible to everyone as possible about that. Um, I think that having sites network, um, sites that do indexing in particular, having them network with community liaisons, people who are working, working actively you know, with peer-to-peer -peer counseling and frontline counseling like SFISI.org and organizations like that, and you know, even community health clinics to just sort of keep up with you know, what people are calling themselves, you know, and also, you know, even sort of graphing, like, what sort of the urgent interests are at this point as well. So, I, keeping it as low, low entry level as possible, like Wikipedia, basically, and trying, trying to keep it up to date. Um, um, through your presentation, you were using uh, the words anonymous and private, mm -hmm. uh, more or less interchangeably. But they're, they're different concepts. Yes. Right? Right. Um, so what do you think is more important to uh, people searching for accurate sex information or for porn? What's more important, anonymity or privacy? Well, I don't think that I could choose either one because I can't speak for the majority of users. Um, and I would also say that the majority of users co confuse the two terms. Um, I think that there is a tacit, uh, I think that users tacitly think that when they're online, they just are anonymous. They don't know that they need to go uncheck things. They don't need to, to you know, they don't know that they need to erase their search history. They don't, you know, the, the new user doesn't know about cash and cookies and things like that. So um, I think that, I mean, we're talking about people who are just figuring a lot of this stuff out. They don't need, you know, they don't know that shopping at an online sex store, you know, well, the sex store may, you know, can, like, guarantee their privacy in terms of shipping and packaging, may not necessarily guarantee their anonymity when it comes to selling their info to third parties. So, I think that there's a lot of confusion between the two terms, and as far as choosing which one is more important. I would say that on a, on a cultural value level, anonymity, because it allows people the freedom to figure out and look for and explore and try and understand who they are more. Um, and, but I think that privacy um, is a more, would be the more physical, urgent uh, thing because privacy is the way that people get found out. It's the way that people get outed. It's the way that they can be tracked. Um, it's the way that they can be harassed, stalked, humiliated, lose their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So, Uh, back, back to the 2257 searches, mm -hmm. uh, were the, uh, are the paths to those, uh, to that uh, uh, content primarily through image search or yes. are they, uh, and not so much through other, uh, other search uh, entry points? So if I, you know, if I search for 2257 on, uh, on Google.com web search, uh, that doesn't generally lead to that type of content? That's correct. It was just the, the image search that led to the direct files. Although I've also randomly found websites that are like, here's our 2257 info for each girl and the girl with their IDs, and I'm like, oh no. So this is back at the very beginning. Um, you're talking about how you basically uh, you know, did a search through Craigslist. I was just really curious, do you have or do you have like an easily rememberable link to um, what the actual breakdown is? Oh, when I, I was just, data mining? Yeah. Like, what, I, what, what do people mostly look for? I don't know. You know what? Um, it's a Google spreadsheet, and it's mm -hmm. public. Oh, So cool. um, I'll, it I'll blog it as soon or? as I'm done. I'll put it on my, on my site. And, it's, and it's, it's local data, and then the beginnings of me starting to do the national data, and then get to I got totally freaked out about people having sex with dogs in Texas, so I stopped for a little <laughs> while. Because <laughs> there was, like, a lot of them, and I was like, oh, this isn't going to be a good article for the Chronicle. So. <laughs> How can I, uh, no. <laughs> but 
but yeah, it's a it's a Google Doc. Yay, Google Docs, and it's public because I think that, and you know, as I add, you know, go back and add more information, it's fun to have people sort of like watch it grow and change and email me about you know different stuff. So, awesome. uh, anybody else? Yay! Thank you.